let's journey through your consumer decision-making process. Let's say you're in the market for a new television set. You've looked at Google reviews, you've talked to your friends, you've done all your research to find your newest TV, and you found it, this beautiful 4K, 60-inch television set. There it is. Isn't she beautiful? Now let's go to the store. You walk in the store, you see it on the wall. Yeah, that's the TV I want. That's the one I want to get. The salesperson approaches you and says, how can I help you? I want to get this TV. You made an excellent choice. Ooh, I'm a smart customer. I made a good choice today. All right, but I have to be honest with you. This TV here costs $1,000. If you go to the sister store that's five kilometers away, you can get the same TV for $20 less, $980. How likely are you to drive five kilometers to save $20 on a $1,000 TV? I see some head shaking, no. And that's the average answer. It's like, no, I want convenience. I'm just going to spend the $20 here. I don't want to drive and park and have to worry about all that nonsense. I'll just buy the TV here for $1,000. So we get the TV home. We're happy. We use it. Two weeks pass by, and now we want to get a new DVD player to augment our beautiful TV. We do a Google reviews, talk to our friends, do our research, and we find the best possible DVD player that we can get. There it is. We go back to the store. The salesperson says, welcome back. What can I do for you? I want that DVD player right there. You've made an excellent choice. Ooh, again, I'm a smart customer. But I have to be honest with you, if you go to our sister store that's five kilometers away, this $40 DVD player is now $20. Now, how likely are you to drive five kilometers to save $20 on a $40 DVD player? I see some head shaking yes, and that's the average answer. So why is it that the significant majority of people won't drive five kilometers to save $20 on a $1,000 item, but they're more likely to drive five kilometers to save $20 on a $40 item? Let's put that same scenario into buying a car. Let's say you're shopping for a car, and the salesperson says, this car here costs 35,000 bananas. Okay, we can make that work. Well, we can add this super-duper cool stereo into there for an extra $500. Hmm. This is where consumer math kicks in. Well, $500 at 3% interest over 60 months, yeah, let's make that work. Does anybody here own a $500 stereo that is not attached to their vehicle? I didn't think so. It's not too often we see that. Because we anchor with one, yet it takes us the same amount of time to earn $20. So why is $20 perceived differently with a TV and $1,000 and differently than with a DVD player? Okay. So we finished our shopping experience, kind of hungry. Let's still take a drive and find some food. The average person will drive past a new restaurant or a new store 22 times before they go inside. So think about that brand new restaurant that opened up not far from where you live, that new store that opened up. You said, you know what? I want to go shop at that new store. I want to check out what they have. 22 times is the average, the median number of times that we'll drive past. Now, there are outliers in the thousands. There's that one store or restaurant that is near your home that you've never been to. So 22 times seems nothing compared to the outliers. All right, so we find that new restaurant, and we go by the parking lot. Ooh, doesn't seem really appealing. Nobody's in the parking lot, right? Why would I want to eat somewhere if no one's there? Because the most persuasive thing we can do is show that other people are doing it too. If the parking lot's empty, well, I guess no one else is eating there, so it must not be good. But then when you look at a parking lot from above, this is a satellite imagery from an outback steakhouse in the United States. And if you look at the shape of the parking lot, it's kind of like a, a funnel. Well, if you, if you limit the quantity of parking spaces in the front of the building, what you're doing is you're allowing less cars to park there, which makes it look like there's more people dining at the restaurant than there really is. And if you have the appearance of more people dining there, then, well, it might be a better place to eat. So by changing the shape of the parking lot, you're influencing consumer behavior on what people want to enjoy. All right, so we chose our restaurant. Let's go have a meal. The menu, the greatest marketing tool ever made. This is why, here's why the, mar the menu is so persuasive. When you go to that electronic store and you ask for that TV, the salesperson doesn't prevent you with a list of everything that electronic store has. It doesn't list every TV, every DVD player, but at food service, in restaurants, they're providing you with a list of everything you can possibly spend money on. So here's the menu. And we look at that menu, and through human eye tracking, we know that this is the way the human eye tracks throughout menus on a, on a bifold menu. You'll start somewhere in the 70s, 
center top right, and then go towards the top right. Now, in the majority of menus, the entrees will be listed in the top right-hand corner, your most expensive items. Now, in that top right-hand corner, you might see the average items between $11 and $15 per item. Now, you might see that one item. Say you go to a diner. Well, how, how likely are you to eat surf and turf at a diner? Probably not likely to have surf and turf at a diner. There might be one lobster tail in the freezer, and it's there just to make the other items look more reasonable. Because if you, if you have a $23, $25, or $27 item in that, in that section, and everything else is between $11 and $15, you're anchoring. You're showing that everything else is reasonable compared to that one item. Whereas if you didn't have the one more expensive item, everything else is comparable to things outside of that restaurant. Here's something else about menus. We've had bad experiences at restaurants, yet we still go back to restaurants. If we had a bad experience buying a used vehicle, we may never buy a used vehicle ever again. We may only buy new and vice versa. But restaurants will continue to go back because with a menu, we have a positive experience. A colleague once asked me, hey, Mike, I want to show you our brochure. Sure, show me your brochure. So I'm thinking he's going to pull out this skinny, glossy, trifold piece of paper with company information on it. What do we do with brochures? We throw them in the trash. We don't, we don't read them. We don't care about them. They're considered garbage material. But he didn't pull out a traditional brochure. He pulls out this giant piece of cardstock bifold. It's, it's like holding a fan in front of your face. And I said, well, you don't have a brochure here. I said, what do you mean? What you have is a menu. It's like, I, I don't get it. It's like, you have a menu of services or a menu of offerings. A menu is a positive word, whereas a brochure is negative. Let's not associate your company's products or services with a negative um, thing like a brochure. So I'm saying that off of lived experience and research. Let's actually test this. So we tested it with all the types of variables of willingness to purchase, willingness to, to read, length of reading, human eye tracking. And every variable we tested it with um, the word brochure involved, all negative affects. Then we did the opposite and tested everything with the word menu involved and all positive affects. So it's offering a different concept to just by message framing. Whereas 30 years ago, you may have a deal presented to you. Well, if you hear, I have a great deal for you today, you're like, well, you know what? It's probably not a good deal. It's probably a scam. 20 years ago, it was opportunity. Now, opportunity is a bad word. So though today, menu might be a good choice to use and a menu of services, a menu of TVs, 20 years from now, it might not be because it comes associated as a bad thing later on in the future. All right, so it's finished lunch. We're full. Let's take a ride down to our favorite furniture place, Ikea. All right, as we walk into Ikea, we see this giant literal warehouse. So we assume, you know what? This place is going to have everything that I want. All right, it's a warehouse. They should not have any problem keeping stuff in stock. So we do the traditional Ikea maze, and we find the chair that I want. Ooh, that's the chair I've been wanting. It's right there. Whereas most furniture places or most retailers would say, out of stock, none available, order online. Ikea doesn't use that message framing. They use the word oversold, whereas out of stock, unavailable, or order online says, darn you, Ikea, because of your poor logistics management, I can't have my chair. But now it's oversold, and it's much more desirable. So instead of blaming the company, we're blaming the consumer, because the most persuasive thing we can do is show that other people want it too. And instead of blaming the company, we still have a positive experience with the purchase. Say, you know what? Yeah, I did make a good purchase. I'm a smart consumer today. All right, not too bad. Then let's go to the Apple store. It's been a long day of shopping, right? Oof. We gotta buy something already. So we go to the Apple store. And most of us probably have experiences at the Apple store. And then we see the Mac MacBook we wanna get. Like, there it is, Oof. There's that beautiful laptop walking around. Really wanna get it. So the laptop is positioned at a precise 76 degrees, the right angle where you could see the content on the screen, you could see what's happening, but you can't really read the text. Because at 76 degrees, you have to take your two thumbs and push the screen back. We know that through research that you're more likely to buy something once you engage with it, touch it, smell it, taste it, lick it. Once you have body-to-body -body contact or body-to-item contact with that product, you are more than likely to buy it. So we know if you're going to put your skin on that laptop, you're more than likely to buy it. 76 degrees is the magic number. All right, so we've had a long day of shopping. I think it's time probably for us to take a break. I'd like to go to the beach. Now, you're sitting on a beach on a hot day, and you want nothing more than your favorite brand of beer. 
Your friend says he's going to get up and go to the only place around. It is a small, run-down grocery store. And he'll bring you back your favorite brand of beer as long as it costs as much or less than the price you're willing to pay. So to recap, your friend's going to bring you back a beer from the only place around, the small, run-down grocery store, as long as it costs as much or less than the price you're willing to pay. Now, in your mind, you have a price you're willing to pay. Five bananas, six bananas, ten bananas. That's okay. Keep it to yourself. You're allowed to have that price. What if we reverse the scenario or change it and revise it and said, it's no longer a small, run-down grocery store. Now it's a fancy resort. Now how much are you willing to pay for that beer? The economic value and the perceived value of the beer significantly change. Yet the beer was brewed in the same facility, bottled by the same company, shipped by the same truck, and sold in the same way. And yet you're still consuming it on the beach, so the environment doesn't change. Yet the average person is willing to pay $8 in change from the smaller and grocery store and $12 in change from the fancy resort. Significantly different, just like the TV example, when the perceived value changes based upon the convenience value or the perceived value. Now, take that same scenario and let's add time pressure to it. One of my favorite persuasive constructs is time pressure, the, the deadline. So let's say you have only the small rundown grocery store and your friend says the store closes in 10 minutes. Whether you get that beer in minute one or minute nine, you still get it at the price whatever it's selling for. Yet, when someone tells you the store closes in 10 minutes, so much cognitive energy gets focused on the time that it overrides all of the economic decision making. And we're willing to pay 35% more for that beer just because the store is closing in 10 minutes, whether you get there in time or not. The same scenario goes down to buying concert tickets online. Let's say you're buying concert tickets for your favorite artist. Right? The website says you have two minutes and 56 seconds remaining to complete your order. 55 seconds, 54 seconds. How do we respond? We pull out a credit card, we type real fast, we misspell our name. Panic, fear, and anxiety. All over the Backstreet Boys. We react this way, and in the qualitative research, we get the most common answer. How do you feel after you get those concert tickets? How do you feel when you get that last airline ticket? I feel like I won. Ooh, I won. Wait, who did you beat? Who did you really beat in that scenario? Did you beat the company? No. Well, they kind of won because the retailer got your capital and you got your concert tickets. So it's kind of a win-win scenario, but you did get your seats you wanted. So it goes in sort of the way also with scarcity. Another phenomenal persuasive construct is that when there's limited quantities or limited availability, if we're looking for concert tickets, we know there's only so many remaining, so we want to get the exact ticket we want. We want to sit on that aisle and the clock is ticking, so all our cognitive energy goes towards that clock. There is one hotel remaining at this price. There is one airline ticket remaining at this price. Is there really? For the significant majority of companies, the ethics are there. Yes, there is one remaining at that price. There are some that are you know, a little shady, but for the most are doing the right thing. And so yes, so you want to win to get that, right? We gamify it. We make it a, a more positive experience as, as in gamifying it. So we look at it like this. Who is the customer now? And who does the customer want to be? Two very significant questions. Who's the customer now? And who's the customer want to be? Let's put ourselves in that scenario. Who here has something in their closet they've never worn? I am guilty of that, 100%. Okay, we've all been to the store and be like, yeah, that shirt, that dress, I'm going to look awesome in that. I'm going to wear that to that, that event coming up next month. And we've never worn it. Because we want to be that person. But yet we know we spend it on who we want to be in the future, not who we are today. I'll give you an example of my own personal decision making. Yeah, I may study this, but I'm also human and a customer and I'm flawed as well. So I go skiing and I love to ski. But I live in North Carolina in the United States. And we have some hills, but nothing significant for skiing. So I go about once a year. And I'm in the pro shop looking at stuff and there's the presentation of the video playing for GoPro. And I'm watching the presentation like, yeah, that's pretty cool. There's a person jumping out of a helicopter, got a GoPro attached to them, doing all these cool tricks and like, yeah, I'm gonna be that person. All right, so I buy this GoPro. All right, let's break this down a little bit. I live in North Carolina. We don't have a 4,000 foot vertical. I'm not a brave man. I'm not jumping out of helicopters. And uh, so I put this on. I've used this GoPro twice. Once was to test it out in my living room, the second time skiing. And um, the video is, is not very impressive. I wouldn't show it on the screen because it's uh, quite embarrassing. All right. I am not the accomplished skier. So who is the customer now who's going to want to be? And so it comes down to three, three persuasive constructs that are really important. The first one is, um, authenticity. 
How can you be authentic with your customers? The second is um, transparency. Show your weaknesses, show your flaws. There's a, a cough syrup company in North America called Buckley's. Buckley's, um, it tastes horrible. If anybody's ever had Buckley's cough syrup, you know it's not something you want to take, taste. It doesn't taste like grape, it doesn't taste like cherry. It is miserable. So Buckley's took their um, advice from their consumers and put some flavoring into it. Let's make it taste better. People stop trusting it, stop taking it. Well, why? Well, we perceive it to be, well, if it tastes bad, it probably works. So Buckley's didn't try to continue to just make the flavor taste better. They embraced that and said, you know what? Let's change our tagline, Buckley's. It tastes horrible and it works, right? Because we trust it, right? If it tastes hard, it's probably gonna work. It's probably good medicine, right? So, um, and then the last one is trust or perceived trust. Approximately 13 digital touch points for a consumer to make a decision and say, yeah, you know what, I, I have some perceived trust in that brand that I'm willing to buy from it. 13 touch points, that one ad, the one mention, the one word of mouth, all adds up to that 13. But to build a friendship, if you and I want to have a friendship together, 196 hours before I'm willing to trust you. I'm going to see you and talk to you for 196 hours before I'm willing to trust you. That's a long time. Do you want to see me for 196 hours? I don't think so. You don't want to tolerate this face for, for almost 200 hours? No, I don't think so. So it, that's a long time to build a friendship, but a lot less time to build perceived trust. So let's gamify this session just like retailers would gamify um, the website and feel like you won. All right, so I'm going to show you on the screen some, uh, some shapes. When you see the shape, I want you to yell out the color you see. So each shape will have a different color. So if the color is red, just yell out red. We'll do the first one together. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. All right, the first one is black. All right, now you. <laughs> Faster? <laughs> the most persuasive thing we can do is show that everyone else is doing it too. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>